Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another broadcast of Northwest Georgia Cryptics. I'm Rick Weaver, and I'm joined tonight, as always, by my co-host, Mr. Blake Duckworth. Our guest How's for tonight's going? show is Mr. Travis Bowen, Virginia team leader from Animal Research. Uh, Travis has got, I've got some pigs here that uh, Travis got a few weeks ago up in Virginia. And it's really going to amaze you. I, I really think you're going to actually enjoy it. Um, well, if you got anything before I bring Travis back on? No. Just uh, as always, guys, um, if you guys have any encounters or anything uh, that you would like to share with us or come on the show, as always, email Ricky. Um, and thank you, guys, for your guys' support. Um, if you're not subscribed to the channel, a little subscribe button and a little bell. Turn the little bell. <laughs> hey, remember to hit the like button, folks. Show uh, show YouTube you like our content. All right, guys, I'm gonna bring Mr. Travis on without any any further delay. Hello, Travis. Welcome to the show, bud. Good evening. Thank you. How's it going, Travis? You doing all right tonight, brother? <laughs> yeah, doing pretty good. Hope y'all doing good. Doing good. Just. Just got off work, scrambling to get 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 settled down and do this. <laughs> hey man, I guess I'm doing all right for an old fat man. <laughs> I, I, I uh, Blake, I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures here, folks. I'm gonna show a couple of pictures that uh, Travis took up in Virginia. Uh, after the show, if you will comment, let us know how you like it. Uh, let me see where we're at here. Okay, this is the first one. Travis, I'm going to bring this thing up here, and I'll let you kindly uh, narrate and tell what happened. All right. Oh, wow. How you like that, Blake? So, yeah. Uh, so, I'll go ahead and be honest with everybody in saying that I'm not the best for finding footprints because I am the world's worst for actually looking for them. <laughs> And the day I found that one and the others, they were all in the same general area right there. Um, I was not investigating anything like I was. I was going down to a fishing hole. It's a uh, old roller mill of a dam, and it, it's a dirt road comes through that state road. And I just backed in right there, going you know do a little fishing, catch some knotty head suckers at the creek, just fun. I actually had a day off work, and. Uh, <laughs> I got out the truck and I walked around the front of the truck and I saw, I mean, there's people, a lot of people come in and out of there during the day, especially in the summertime, you know. And um, I come around the truck and I mean, there's tire tracks, there's footprints, dogs, where people bring dogs down there. And I saw one, one print just caught my eye because it wasn't overly large, but it was big for a bare foot, a bare footprint. I don't mean a bear like I'm bear, I'm talking about just a bare foot. Right. It was, uh, the heel was disproportionately wider than what it should have been, and it didn't have a curve to it. It just had that blocky, straight, you know. Right, kind that's of the one you're referring to there? That's not the one, but that's one of them. Um, keep on, if you don't mind, flip through right there, and I'll tell you which one was the first one I spotted. Okay, let me the, go back here. Yeah, the more I went, the more I found, actually. Okay. That's it right there. That is the one that, that one, I almost hit that with my, my truck tires just out of view of that picture. I almost ran over. And it's Man, I'll tell you what. Looking at that print, you can see the uh, the dorsal ridge in the print where the foot actually separates. Mm. And a human print doesn't do that. And no. also, this one looks more like a three toed print to me than it does actually a five toed. I think it had five toes, but the smaller toes they didn't they didn't individual print well right there. Right. That, that sounds pretty coarse. But uh, got a got a question um, about how big was the print? Did you get any measurements on it or? I did, I had nothing no. with me. No casting material, no tape. I like I said, I was going fishing. It was the furthest thing from my mind, just by sheer luck. Now, ever since I've got everything in the truck, goes <laughs> with me everywhere. You didn't, you didn't just like put your put your foot beside it to get a size comparison. Well, that, or? 
particular print right there was slightly bigger than my boot. That's my boot print right there. That's my foot. That's a size nine call heart steel toe work boot. Um, I mean, I could give you a measurement, I guess. I have to actually measure it right now. That was by far the bigger print I found. Um, that's at least 15 inches. Yeah, that thing is huge. And the others, like to say, they weren't. It wasn't that they were overly large, but they were big to be a bare foot, and they won't shape right. They had no curve. I mean, they were human. They were bare human footprints there also, because like I say, people do come there, you know, to play in the water, fish, whatever. And those particular prints I took pictures of just noticeably were just anatomically not right compared to the people's footprints that were around. Right. Here's exactly. another one. Yeah. That's what caught me. You know, the other thing, if you look at that picture right there, just to the left of it, you can see where I stepped with my boot. And right. Didn't, didn't, yeah. I did not sink in a bit. Like, that's coarse sand. This ain't like old powdery beach sand. This is old coarse, rough river bottom sand. Right, right. It's river bottom sand. You don't you don't just sink down into it too easy. I mean, my boots, I was literally just leaving well, you, just a yeah. point. You can I see a, a footprint right beside that one, and I mean, far as the the depth of it, I mean, it's not even right, right. Nowhere near as deep as those prints. Right, it's gonna take something, you know, with, with a lot of body yeah. mass to, to put a put an indention in the ground like that. And then here's another one right there. Man, you got some awesome prints there. Like I say, I, I'm the world's worst for not finding them. I, even when I'm out and about, I, I don't. I just don't really look for them. I mean, if I, if I run up on one, get lucky, which I did. I, I'm just. I'm more. I'm always looking around, um, right. listening. You know, which I do that period in the woods. I mean, that's just years of hunting, that sort of thing. You know. Well, folks, Travis, Travis had sent me a, a couple of video clips, but. Uh, uh, me being an IT guy, I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to get them, get them uploaded onto. Bless you, Ricky. Stream yard. <laughs> I've got to get me an IT guy. <laughs> All right, Travis. Well, um, you just kind of want to explain, you know, who you are a little bit, what you do, you know, what got you into the. The cryptic world and, you know, first experience, just a little bio and everything about yourself. Yeah. Um, like I said, I live in South Central Virginia. I'm I'm about 20 minutes north of the Virginia-North Carolina line. I'm in the foothills of Blue Ridge. Um, I've lived here my whole life. Grew up farming, um, ripping, running the creek bottoms, woods, and you know, I've hunted and fished, trapped, day hunt, night hunt camp out i'm just outdoors kind of person you know um for a living i'm actually a uh, field chemical operator for a chemical plant we do custom composites and that sort of thing high-end kind of stuff um been in the chemical industry for about 18 and a half years now and as far as what got me into it i mean i I've, i'll be honest i've always been interested in spooky stuff interesting stuff i mean i'm I'm a student of anything interesting. It don't matter what it is, whether it be something natural, science, history. You know, I just, I'm a curious person. I love to learn. But what really got me into it, um, there was several weird things over the years that got me to where I am. It culminated to one night right after dark, a sight that it won't know explaining the way. I mean, I just, I know what I saw. I wasn't alone. I had my mom and my oldest daughter with me. She was a at the time. And, you know, that, that solidified and kind of tied together a whole lot of things from the past. It really started making more sense. After looking at it from a whole different point of view, from a kind of an interesting, you know, curious. Sorry, my dog is just gulping water behind me. Um, <laughs> But I was, uh, I was 14, 15 years old, the first real weird experience I had, and I was hunting and um, got paced out of the woods a long ways at that. Um, late in the evening, early fall, and to this day, I'll tell anybody, and I, I believe it then, it, it sounded bipedal. It was small enough to stay far enough back where I couldn't get 
really see it, but it kept up with me. It never closed on me, never made any sound other than just following me. But it just sounded, I mean, honestly, at the time, I thought it was somebody. But where I was, it shouldn't have been anybody there, especially that would do that. I mean, this is very remote, private land. You know, it's just not, it ain't like it's a lot of, you got just whoever in and out. I mean, there's no roads there. There's no four-wheel ATV trails, no horse trail. I mean, you have to walk and you have to jump fences and cross pastures. And it's just not very accessible. And that kind of got me, got me curious, you know, because I couldn't explain it away anymore. I thought about it just more, really want to get into it. And a couple of years later, me and my younger brother, my cousin, we decided to camp up there one night. And we went up there in a day, set up camp, put a tent up, got firewood, that sort of thing. We left, come back. It was like 10, 1030 at night, probably 11. I don't know, it was later on. It was dark, plenty dark. And on the way in, we're walking in the cow pasture, the creek's to our right, and the creek is wooded with woods on the other side of the creek. And I started thinking I was hearing something walking with us. They said the same thing. So we decided we'd walk a little bit. And I said, look, I'll count to three. We'll do one, two, three, stop. We did one, two, three, stop. It took like two steps and it stopped. We've done this one more time just to verify what we already was pretty sure of. And whatever it was, paced us all the way up to our camp, stayed on the other side of the creek, and actually circled us slowly and methodically for the majority of the night, on into the early morning hours. This thing would go down the creek on the other side. We could hear it cross. We could actually hear it get in the water. And, I mean, this was years and years and years ago, like over 20 years ago, matter of fact. We wouldn't have night vision or flea or any of that kind of stuff back then. The best thing we had was like a rechargeable spotlight. But that was, you know, we didn't sleep in that tent all night. We stayed around that fire. I mean, we wouldn't get in the tent. And um, I don't know, a year or two after that, me and my cousin and the buddy went up there, and we were in the tent, raining that night. It, it was a miserable night. It started raining about 9, 10 o'clock, rained all night. And it was early, early morning. I'm thinking like 4, 4, 30. Something sounded heavy, sounded bipedal come walking down the creek right up behind the tent and I distinctly remember hearing it breathing it was literally just right outside of the tent on the back of the tent it pushed on the back of the tent three or four times just not rough just almost like curious just felt of it and went on down the creek on out of here and that, that actually was the last time I slept in the tent I don't sleep in tents after that <laughs> I don't care anything about it um, then I'm probably the same year. That was early spring. I want to say this was the following fall. We, we couldn't leave this thing alone. It was just creepy. It was kind of fun. We were young. You know, we are 18, 19 years old. <clears throat> so we go up there again. And up this creek bottom, it's, it's bordered by a high, steep ridge line. And at the time, which has grown back now, they've logged it, but it's grown back. But back then, it was very old, huge, old growth oaks. So you get around it pretty good. And um, that particular night, I walked up in there by myself because everybody had something they needed to do first. I said, well, I'm going on up there to set up camp. Y'all just come on whenever you're ready. Right. And I was set up. I'd been up there a long time by myself, had fire going and everything. And um, they drove in on a farm across a creek as far as they could get with a truck. And Buddy, he had old big GMC, lifted, loud, built motor, you know, they coming in. And I actually got up, and I, I walked around the creek, which going downstream, just a few yards from where I had my camp set up, made a dead right turn, and the ridge line followed it. So basically, I was in the bend of the creek, and the ridge line come up to a point almost to the creek itself. It's just like a maybe a four-wheeler wide trail right there that – was the bottom of the hill to the edge of the creek. This, this was a game trail. Like I say, there's no access in there by vehicle. I mean, it's once you cross that creek, you're on foot. Anyways, I was standing there, and I could see the cab light on the truck where they had the doors open. I could hear them talking through the woods there. I mean, it was a couple of hundred yards or so away. And I thought I heard something up above me on the hill, 
just enough to catch my attention. I looked up, and against the skyline, the moon was out. I mean, the sky was lighter, you know, just kind of had that old gray purple color to it. Between a couple of those fairly good sized oak trees up, and like I said, this ridge is very steep, so I'm looking up at probably a good 50 degree angle. There was something big and dark filling up the spot between two of those trees. That didn't necessarily catch my attention because that could just been, you know, another tree or whatever. They shut that truck door. When they shut the truck door, whatever that was, took off running. And I caught just enough of a glimpse to know it was really big and it wasn't smooth and slick like a deer or a bear. It had like, I, I saw like gaggy, rough, grizzled, you know, matted. I don't even know how to describe it really. It looked like a like a cheap fake Halloween wig against the skyline. I mean, it just looked, it didn't look smooth like a deer or a bear. And that was, I mean, nothing else happened that night. Uh, we got followed up there a couple other times, you know. I got followed up there once in the like, middle of the day. Um, and then we end up, we moved out from the farm. My family, some of my family still owns the farm. But just kind of drifted away from it for a while. And um, my house I live in now, I live I actually live up on the side of White Oak Mountain. And I think it probably the first fall I had this house. Me and my girlfriend at the time were here, and she had gone out to her car. And she come back in the house, and she said, come out here and tell me what this is. And I'm like, what? She said, I, I heard something. Come out here and tell me what it is. And, you know, think, you know it's probably a coyote, a bobcat, whatever. So I come outside, and that's the one and only time in my life I've ever But it, that, I guess one of them up on the mountain behind the house doing that yelling, roaring, god-awful Sounded like the Ohio house, exactly what it sounded like. And that one was actually close enough I could feel it. I mean, you could actually feel the, the vibration of it in the chest. And off, I'm going to guess, probably a mile or more away, actually across a major highway, one, they go back and forth with one yelling to him. And I assume him. And um, they yelled back and forth a few times. And my girlfriend, you know, she's like, and I mean, I had chills, you know. Believe me if I tell you, because I had heard the Ohio howls on something, you know. So I actually looked it up. Um, she is to tell you how long ago she had a BlackBerry phone that had internet. I didn't even have a phone that had internet back then. <laughs> and I, I found it and played it for, and her eyes got big, you know. I was like, it just sounded just like it. And that kind of rekindled an interest and got me thinking about the weird stuff that happened down there on the farm and all. And, um, we ended up went to her daddy's farm, which is on the other side from me. Me and her, and my brother, and his girlfriend, and um, I had recorded myself trying to mimic that as best I could on an old iPod, and I had a predator call that I could plug that iPod into, based on call blast. So that's what we did. This is this is like the beginnings of this very archaic. So. <laughs> but part way through that, we. Had had something to do a real low guttural grunt not loud just like something slipped in fairly close and grunted at us and um that was pretty much the end of that so we started on our way out and we were walking out so over there it's like a really hard packed atv trail you can walk it real quiet it's really it's actually a really good trail and getting close to the field where the truck was i just got the wild hair i was like well, i'm gonna lean back see if anything's following us i had night vision then the old old really antique bushnell gen one monocular so i stepped behind a couple of trees there and i had the infrared illuminator on and i was waiting and i mean i could see them out there getting in the truck and they was talking this and that other one the truck wasn't that far away i was just inside the woods and I honestly don't remember if I thought or heard something, just looked or just felt like it was something. I don't know. But I stepped out, kind of peeked around that tree with that hour illuminator, and there was a big pair of eyes that seemed too tall and too far apart, too big around, maybe 30, 40 yards down the trail behind us. It very quickly, when I hit it with that hour night vision, sidestepped behind the tree. So I turned around and put it on out myself. And that really, it, it kind of, it was kind of spooky, you know. But that really got me even more into it. And it would have been four years ago this April, where the evening me and my mom and my daughter 
went back down there to where I, where I grew up where we had all the weird stuff happen years ago. And we actually, I had managed to hit one with a white light that evening. So, that, and he, I assumed he took the size of it because best guess, I went back, we went back the next day and I stood there where it stood, put my hand over my head. And I've measured a deep flat, put my boots on. I, I'm still playing for right now, seven foot two inches. And they both agreed that he was tall. Uh, dirty blonde. I mean, just ass. But he responded to tree knocks. <clears throat> I whooped at him, run it back. Came in, snuck around. I had a ATM, um, XD. Infrared rifle scope on the gun. Never saw him. I think he, he was smart enough. He knew to stay out of the power of light. Looked around behind me while it was going on. And finally, I, I could just hear it sounded too close to me. And like I said, I had my mom and my daughter with me. You know, I was kind of, I ain't gonna say I was afraid because there's nothing really, there's nothing aggressive about it. It was just the, the whole situation was weird. So I didn't get kind of protective, but on that, on that rifle, I, I had a white LED tack light. So I just threw on this tack light and spun around the rifle, and that dude won 15, 20 yards away. He didn't got in the field. And behind us. But that that definitely that took me from being able to try and dismiss away, oh, you know, what was this, what was that, or you imagine that, or, you know, I mean, when you see no, something... That was- that was proof in the pudding. Huh? That was proof in the pudding. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. That's why people, you know, like guys at work, they always rib me and pick on me, you know, like, you really believe in it? I'm like, no, I don't believe in it. I know it. <laughs> it's the difference in believing yeah. something. You believe something because you think it's there real. Once you've experienced the scene, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that's the way I am, guys. I had my first encounter with these things back in 1981. Saw it on the creek with the float fishing. And uh, <clears throat> this thing was, I guess, I'm going to say it was young juvenile, probably five and a half, six foot tall. <clears throat> but he was bent over and had his hands down in the water. When I first saw it come around the creek, bend in the creek, first saw it, you know, I thought it was a uh, bear. And, but when this thing raised up, we were about 40 yards from it. Like I say, moving along pretty good in the raft. But when this thing raised up and looked at us and its hands come up out of the water, you know, I was expecting bear paws, but it wasn't bear paws. It was it was actually a hand like ours, other than just covered in black hair down to about the middle knuckle. And the fingers were like a leathery looking color. And it was just, it, it, it was wild, man. The whole encounter didn't last, but maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds uh, before he turned and bound back into the thick cover behind us. But, uh, you know, that's an experience that you'll never forget. And believe me, even after all these years, I've never forgot it. Well, that's Same the here. thing. I mean, you, you run up on something that's not supposed to exist it kind of goes out of the realm of explanation and all of a sudden you're standing there looking at it yourself you know it it, it burns it burns an imprint into your brain that just don't go away no that's exactly right i mean you know we can sit here and, and tell our viewers you know what's actually happened to us but until they experience for their sales they yeah. The sheer magnitude of what one of these animals are actually like when they actually see one up close, then you know, people really don't understand or believe, you know, what we say until it, until they actually experience it themselves. Well, the thing that got me, especially with the the most recent sighting, I mean, I, I'll claim I'll claim three. The first one being the one on the hill that night years and years ago, the one in the night vision, and the one, definitely the one saw with the light. But the thing that got out, it humbled, especially as a hunter, that something that big could get that close that fast. 
and me never see it until I just by sheer luck surprised it with that white light. Because that the scope I use, I use the predator hunt with. That's what I bought it for. It's a day night fully digital scope with an external yeah. infrared later. It's it's pretty pretty good quality. I mean, and he managed to get that close in fairly open woods at that, and did it quick. I mean, all this played out in just a matter of minutes. So I mean, right. I was, you know, if, if we hadn't already been aware, if he hadn't done the tree knocks and grunted. That dude could have snuck right up on us and just chilled, and we never, never would have knew he was there. Yep. So that makes me wonder how many times have you been in the woods that they were around? You know, right? I just started to say that, you know. And that's what I was. That's what I was just about to say is, uh, you know, place that me and Ricky's had a lot of our experiences. Um, you know, there are two times I can think of that. Um, could have pretty much reached out and grabbed, you know, grabbed us, you know, that once we were basically the both times that they were, we got super close were housed. Um, I mean, B probably, I don't know, how far you think that was that night that, um, it how we got that howl, it sounded like you, Ricky. I mean, probably oh, what, maybe probably 50 yards? What, 60 yards, 50, 60 yards. Like yeah. And this thing, yeah, and, um, we were to, 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 to you know, kind of uh, fill the, the viewers in on this. We were uh, uh, down at the lake, and there's a there's a big uh, uh, slough that comes in off the main part of the lake. And the thing, the water level was down low. So... Uh, as far as ground coverage, about 50 yards. And this thing was up on a bank at the uh, far side of the lake. And we'd been over to these big rocks that's there on the side of the lake, and we'd come back down and uh, stopped, and Blake told me to do a howl. So I did. And, man, just as soon as, I mean, just, just as soon as my howl trailed off, this thing howled back at us. But, dude, it sounded just like, the howl that I had just given. Sound it's, like somebody recorded Ricky Howl and, and played back the recording. Right. This I is, mean, this, it, it I couldn't mean, have been any more of a doppelganger, I mean, type of 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 mimic or whatever you want to call it. I mean, it, it was spot on with the way Ricky sounded. This thing, then, this thing, was, this thing was wild. And we were, were down there, we were down there a few weeks I later in, uh, in a boat. And uh, we had pulled up. We were probably sitting maybe 15, 20 feet off the bank. And yeah, we weren't far away from this one. <laughs> I, told, I told Blake, I said, give a howl, Blake. Well, he was standing at the back of the boat, and his dad was driving, and I was up in the front part of the boat like an idiot. <laughs> if it wanted to got anybody, I'd have been the first one that got. But Blake gave the howl. And some, just as soon as he gave the howl, this thing screamed out at us. He was just right on top of the hill from us, maybe 20 yards, just right yeah, in no the wood line. On. And, dude, this thing, I mean, it wasn't a howl. This thing actually screamed at us like we had really pissed this thing off. And <laughs> <laughs> I felt my heart stop. And I, I hollered at Blake and Johnny, get us the hell out of here. That's the way I think to say. So Johnny cranked the boat and got us back out in the middle part of the lake. But dude, I, I have was going to jump in the water. I mean, like he was going, like he was going to help a situation. <laughs> I have never been so scared in my life as what I was that night. And and people That's talk, just... people talk about the way these things smell. We went down there a few. Days after that, uh, me, Blake, my roommate, Michael, and my nephew, Kenny, was with us. And, dude, I'm telling you what, as soon as we got down to the lake, we walked all the way around the upper end of the lake, got on the, the far side, and started up into the woods. And this is we started up into the tree line. Dude, I'm telling you what, it was one of the, the most rank smells that I have ever smelled in my life. It was like a mixture of sulfur, rotten eggs. Uh, dog pee and it poured on a wet dog is what it all what it smelled like. I mean, it was it was rank, and it was like that for what Blake 15 20 minutes, 
pretty much the whole time we were in that area. Yeah, and then it just it just faded out. So I know this thing had to be right in there with us. And yeah. it's just smelling it that strong. So that's what I'm saying, you know, people don't realize how close these things can actually be to you and you're in the woods and you not even know it. Yeah, we've at least smelt that smell a handful of times down there. But yeah, I thought, no how, that's just well, that's just two times we know how close we were. They ain't no telling how many times that you know we were, you know, when I actually because that's where I actually had my sight and that is down there where we're talking about. Um, I mean, I was probably I don't know sixty yards, seventy yards from my sighting. But I mean, we've spent so much time down there, and I mean, that's just two times we know that they were close just because of the house. I mean, they ain't no telling how many times we've been walking through the woods or walking down there, and I mean, they just be, you know, arm's length from you pretty much. I mean, too close for comfort. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Well, Travis, up there, where you're from now, you're talking about that area. So, so you're saying that that these things have actually been in that that area for what? 20, 30 years that you know of? Uh, that I know of. I mean, people around here won't talk about it much. I'm I'm slowly getting more, I guess, more people to talk about it. Most of the stories out here are secondhand. You know, my grandpa saw this so back years ago. Well, you know what? Blah, blah, blah. You know, nothing, right. nothing concrete, but <clears throat> there have been a couple of them that have been straight up forward have actually seen them. So that added to some of the other little weird things about, you know, chickens coming up missing and dogs getting their necks broke at night and just stuff like that, you know. I mean, the the, the pieces of the puzzle, they start to tend to fit together. So... I, ble- I mean, I believe this area has probably had them of how long it been here, period. I mean, you know, I I had a cousin a few years ago. He, he's got a farm. This this farm down there where I grew up borders all that land. I mean, it's like I say, it's pretty remote. It's a whole lot of land out there. And he had 20-some chickens come up missing in one night. And his words to me, he said, them damn coyotes. And I said, coyotes didn't get 20 some chickens at the chicken house in one night. You didn't find no chickens or nothing? He said, well, I don't know what else. It had to be them. And he, you know, he's a skeptic because I didn't even push it. But my own opinion, I mean, I can tell you what, I think something went in that chicken house because there was no damage. It wasn't like it was broken into. And I would say it was, tw- I want to say it was 26 chickens, but don't quote me on that. Was just gone. I mean, no feathers, no nothing. They they were gone. So, wow. I mean, I and I know other people's lost stuff like that. You know, I, I know a guy that had chickens in a, a coop. He built himself small coop. He only had like six of them, and you had to open the coop up. It had a little slide lock and bolt, and it was unbolted open. Five chickens were gone. One of them was left with his head crushed in there, or her head, I should say. And the lid was shut, and it was bolted back closed. So, Man, that's I mean, unreal. We had it. We had a guy you... uh, <clears throat> talking about the area there. We had a guy on the show a few weeks ago, uh, and I think you know the gentleman, Michael Patterson. Mm-hmm. And Michael said he had had an encounter up there back in I think what 1989 uh, yep. with yeah, a pilot. Yep. And yeah. uh, I know you said that the one you saw was, was a, a blondish color. Uh, yeah, it was. It was a light color. So, I mean, you know, most of these things that people describe, you know, they describe them as being black or reddish color, brownish color. Uh, so this would lead me to believe that you know maybe that's a different type, uh, uh, either a different type of Sasquatch or or. A different bloodline to what other people are seeing. Well, I, over the years, um, I've been told stories, and these could, this the only thing really. First of all, I know the people personally, the different ones. They don't know each other. I'm the I'm the common ground as far as that goes. But it was several stories that come from an area 
not too far from here. I mean, all this is all within 20 miles of each other. And um, there were several sightings back in the early mid eighties on up into the early nineties of a gray one. And they all said the same thing. It was looked like a, they called it a wild man, a great big wild man, about seven feet tall. And a few people saw it in the daytime. A couple of them saw it at night, you know, but it was all in this kind of the same general area, but these people didn't really know each other. And it more like they were, it was like it was in some kind of group telling the same story. They were all telling the same kind of description, not knowing each other, you know. Right. So that that kind of adds a whole lot of validity to it. Like I say, not only fact, I mean, I know these people. These are just your regular old go to work, hunt, some of them farm, you know, I mean. And they don't, people, people don't want to talk about it a whole lot. And I understand why, you know, because you get, you know, people think you're crazy, want to ridicule you know ridicule you for it but the more i'm the more i ask around and the more i guess people know that i'm into it the more comfortable they get to start talking about it you know one-on-one yeah. and i'm beginning to realize just how many people are actually having experiences with these things and have been for a long time so you know i i'm more and more beginning to believe there's a whole lot more of them out and about moving around and what a lot of people into the field are really believing. You know, well, it goes back, you know, it goes back to a lot of people don't talk about it. You know, a lot yep. of people keep their sightings and what they've had happen to themselves. So, I mean, you know, it's, and the more and more people that tell their stories, I mean, the more validation you have, but that's a problem is just getting people to tell their stories. You know, so many people just want to keep it to themselves. I mean, same here. I mean, like, I know I talk on, I mean, I know I do these podcasts and I talk about it on, you know, to the internet, but they're not, I mean, they're, they are people that know what I do and, you know, what I'm into and what I've had happen, but I haven't shared it with a lot of people myself. I mean, other than, you know, internet wise, I mean, I have, but other than that, that's it like personal people and people in my community and people I know, you know, unless you're really close to me. I mean, I've never, I don't really tell my story just cause I mean, yeah. there, you know, so many people just don't even care or so gun hold to look at you like you're crazy. I mean, right. And I mean, you know, it's, it's like me, uh, uh, deciding I had it back in 1981. Well, in 1981, if you'd have told anybody, look, I, I, I think I saw a Sasquatch. You know, I'd have probably ended up down in, in Rome in the nut house wearing one of them little white jackets they tie you up in. Um, you know, it's just a stigma that, that goes along with the with you know, you saying that you've seen something like this. But I think oh, yeah. uh, I think more for that, you know, I think that, that podcasts like ours, uh, shows like uh, Finding Bigfoot, uh, things of that nature and then uh, what is it, uh, uh monster quest things of that nature uh, has really brought this to the forefront over the last few years but still even with all this going on people are still reluctant to tell their stories well you know the funny thing like guys i work with you know he's a smart intelligent guys i mean to do what we do you have to be to a point right most of them, hunters fishermen outdoorsmen off-road they they out out and about, you know, and they pick and pick and pick on me. My personality, I don't care. I mean, I, you know, I have fun with it. But the amount of BS I'll catch from them would bother a lot of people. And me, mm -hmm. the way I'm wired, I, I'm always having a good time with them. I always grin at them and say, Well, whenever you want to go out in the woods at night and come on with me, I'll come pick you up. And I never <laughs> ever get one to take care of on it. <laughs> and, and I say, well, if it ain't real, then why are you scared to go out there and look for it? And then they're like, well, it might be real. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, you say it ain't, yeah, but you're scared enough to think it could you know, be, right? You're never going to find out unless they go out there and do it. I mean, that's. Yep. You that's know, I, it. I, can sit, I can sit here and tell you all day long, you know, what I've saw over the years. The things we've experienced, Blake and I have had rocks thrown at us. We've had to 
trees pushed over, had the limb breaks. We saw eye shines, uh, uh, you know, all kind of stuff. We were in the cemetery down there one night, and uh, hey, they were throwing, this thing was throwing rocks through the treetops, now through the trees, and these rocks were like the size of basketballs landing at our feet, and we were standing there for the first couple of couple of rocks that got thrown. We didn't know what was going on. Well, after that third or fourth one, you know, I look around and hell, ain't nobody there. All of them's done run off and left me. That's a long thing. <laughs> Blake's daddy, he, he was, he's a character in himself. And uh, I said something to him about it after I caught up with the group and, uh, and Johnny's reply was, well, hell, I didn't have to run out, outrun Sasquatch. All I had to do is outrun you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that, that's the thing I get into. <laughs> that, that was one of the first things my dad had ever experienced. So, I mean, you know, he didn't know what to think about it. I mean, we've been, you know, this area that all this was going on in, uh, we started just going down there as, uh, and, and you know, ghost hunting pretty much in the cemetery i mean you know me and ricky had some things start to you know happen from us going down there and we told my dad about it and, you know he my dad like most people like you know he a lot of people were open-minded about it but you know never had anything happen type situation so he's like you know whatever and we get him down there at one night. He'd been down there with us probably 15, 20 times and nothing happened. Like we were telling him about stuff we'd have happened down there and howls and just all kinds of crazy stuff. And, you know, of course, every time we'd take him down there, nothing happened. And that night when those rocks started coming through the woods, he didn't know what to think about it. <laughs> he was down there the night that um, Ricky uh, talking about that howl where he howled and we got the response back. It sounded just like Ricky. My dad left us that night too. <laughs> oh yeah, they had, him, him and Blake. Actually, we were probably a mile and a half from the truck. Oh, let, let, let's hang on. Ricky just had a heart attack. Like, uh, probably what? Maybe a couple months before this. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah like he was years. getting around, but not around very well. So poor Ricky. I'm sorry, Ricky. You know I love you, right, buddy? Big back now. I look around, <laughs> and Blake and Johnny are nowhere to be found. I, we're a mile and a half over there away from the truck. Finally, when I get back to the truck, they're sitting in the cab of the truck with the doors locked. I had to beat <laughs> on the side of the truck to get them to open the door. And finally, Johnny <laughs> opens the door. I said, man, what in the hell happened, you boy? Johnny said, well, hey, man, after I heard what I did, I wasn't sticking around for nothing. He said, you was on your own. <laughs> and believe me, I was. <laughs> well, so I mean, I'll be the first one to vouch. I, you know, I spent years out there at Coyote Hunt, middle of nowhere, three, four, I mean, on that three, four o'clock in the morning, I'd be, next time, I mean, I'd be a mile or so from a truck. Never thought twice about it. I mean, you know, it's always in the back of your mind. You are out. You, you put yourself back out in, you know, a vulnerable kind of a spot. But yeah, you, you have weird things go through your head and everything. But I mean, you, you know, but just, when, just when like my up, you know, it's it's different when it, it's one thing you out there and you hear this, you hear that. But when something really shows up that ain't supposed to be there, should, shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. That's the same with us. I mean, we, me, my dad, Ricky, I mean, we've all been, you know, at, we're outdoors guys. You know, we, we've encountered just about anything that's in the woods around here. And, you know, just, just the first night that me and Ricky heard the house down there at the at the lake. You know, Ricky was a tax, taxidermist for years. I mean, he's, you know, mounted every animal there are, heard every animal there are in the woods. You know, what we heard down there that first night Needless to say, we we got out of there. I mean, you know, it, it it's right because you know you even, even though, know it's nothing that you've heard before. Even though you know, yeah. even though I had saw one, you know, back in the eighty one, I did not hear that thing. I did not hear it growl. I did not hear it howl. I didn't hear it. You know, then we didn't hear anything out of it. So I didn't know what these things sounded like. 
and that night at the lake down there when this thing thing cut loose you know it actually raised the hair on the back of my neck it, it scared me that bad and and you know i left that night was the night that i left with the perspective that that these things could actually exist you know, well, at that yeah. point, we didn't know what we were dealing with. I mean, well, we were yeah. down there ghost hunting. We were down there ghost hunting, and it actually what happened with that first howl. Um, we heard, the, you know, the, the initial howl, and of course, coyotes followed. Um, I mean, we like I said, we didn't stick around that night. We left as soon as we heard that howl because I looked at Ricky. I was like, "What's that?" He's like, I don't know. <laughs> so we, you know, we didn't know what we were dealing with. So we, you know, we we got out of there pretty quick. And uh, I don't even know what we did. I mean, we, we didn't really talk about it much on the way home. But when we got home uh, back to Ricky's house, you know, we started talking about it. And I was like, what did we hear? You know, and we weren't thinking anything to do with like Bigfoot or anything like that. We're down there ghost hunting. Like, you know, we're yeah. we're totally maybe thinking something paranormal. Like, I mean, just you know, I don't know. Well, um, I think we'd been watching some. We finding Bigfoot was on or something. I can't remember what made me actually look at the house. Like, kind of like your circumstance. Like, you know, how it sounded like the Ohio house. I just started, I searched Bigfoot house and, or, you know, Sasquatch house or whatever. And the, what we had heard sounded like the Sierra sounds or the Sierra house. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, once, once I heard that Ricky was at work and when he got home from work, I I went over there and I was like, Ricky, you gotta listen to this. And sure enough, I mean, that's pretty much what we had heard that night. And, you know, that's what got me curious of what was going on down there and we started going down there doing house ourselves and getting responses and then you know just things started happening we started having the rocks thrown we've had tree breaks um footprints i mean then i actually had my site down there so i mean a lot in one area and i mean even to this day you know this was back in 2011 um and i mean even to this day they they still were in the area down there yeah they that that bound to be a home place for them, at least near. Right, and I, you know, I have people ask me all the time, especially with the uh, uh, Facebook page that we have. Uh, you know, I get a lot of uh, responses on there about uh, uh, how do you know what these things sound like? You know, how do you know they're really real? Well, you know, with the stuff that we've experienced ourselves uh, from 2011 on, uh, uh, you know, that just solidifies that, you know, that they're there, they're real. Uh, I had one guy the other day ask me, you know, well, what do they eat? Well, I responded to him, you know, as big as a Sasquatch is, they eat any damn thing they want to. <laughs> I was say, that actually uh, brings me to something else I had touched on. So, God, this would have been early 90s. I, I'm 40 years old. I was born in 1980. I'm going to say I was probably... 12, 13 years old, and uh, late, late in the rifle season, which would have been like getting on like Christmas time, New Year's, you know. We, uh, me and my daddy, my brother, my brother's four years younger than me. I, he wasn't even carrying a gun then. We started up creek bottom because where everything happened to me was across the dirt. I grew up on a dirt road, off of the dirt road, it was across the dirt road, up, up the creek, off the farm I grew up on. And we started up at Creek that evening, that afternoon, to go up and steel hunt on that bluff, that big ridge line above the creek. And we coming up the creek bottom, and it's a big old, I, I might have been a poplar, I don't know for sure, but it was a fork in the tree. And I'm going to say it was around 10 feet, and the reason I say that, my dad is six foot three. And I remember it being out of his reach. He couldn't just reach it with his hand. But it was a doe in the fork of that tree, laid over, wedged up in the fork of that tree. And we all standing now looking like, how in the world that doe get in that tree? And I've had some people say, well, had it flooded, maybe she washed down, flood water put up there. Well, that's a good idea. Don't get me wrong. But the highest that creek had ever flooded in my lifetime was in 1996 when Hurricane Fran come up through the hill dump like 16 inches of rain overnight and that creek only flooded five feet above the bank 
and this deer was a good 10 11 feet up in that tree and this was way before that so i know water didn't put her up there i don't believe a deer climbed up in the tree and hang you know just laid over in the fork <laughs> so something put that deer in that tree and years later me and my brother on the upper side of this same this huge block i mean this little block of land is five six thousand acres to itself we had gone in on the upper side on another farm up there, black powder hunting. And we were on our way out and we had the truck parked as far as we could get. And driving out, I just had to look out in the woods. And I saw something hanging in a tree over in the woods, 20, 30 yards, you know. So we stopped and go to look. And it was what was left of a black Angus calf that had been eaten on under the tree. Because you could see, like, it was basically like a, a slick with hair. And what was left yeah. of it was hanging for a limb about 12 or 13 feet off the ground. Now, both of them back then, I attributed to being a mountain lion, which we're not supposed to have around here, but people do see them. Mm -hmm. But I've done a whole lot of research, and North American mountain lions, cougars, pumas, whatever you want to call them, do not take game up in trees. They feed on it, and they bury it and cover it on the ground. Yeah. The only big cats that do that are leopards. We ain't got leopards in Virginia. No. <laughs> so, something put a whole deer in the fork of a tree 10, 11 feet off the ground, and something put what was left. This one of a little calf. I mean, the hooves on this calf were probably about four inches in diameter. It was a good sized calf. And this was not in the pasture. This was several hundred yards from the closest fence line to a pasture that I assume that calf came out of, but was put up. And when I say in the tree, it wasn't like it was in the fork of a tree. It was actually out on a limb, not a very big limb. So it was draped. What was left was pretty much was only a hind quarter of the shoulder, hide, and the four legs. And it was draped over the limb of that tree. So. It's amazing yeah, what these things, these creatures can actually do. Uh, you know, when you're walking out in the woods in an area where, where those things are using and uh, you start seeing limb breaks up, you know, 10, 12 feet off the ground. And I'm, and I'm not talking small limbs. I'm talking limbs that's like 10, 12 inches in diameter. And these things are, yeah. you know, just snap like, like you would snap a twig. And, and left, you know, and every one of them I've ever found is basically, especially if you, know, if you find more in an area than one, you know, they're all pointing in the same direction. And, you know, this, this leads me to believe that they're, they're using these things like trail markers or whatever. But, man, you know, the size, size of a creature it would take to stand and break something 10, 12 feet off the ground like that, especially that big, big of a limb. You know, yeah. the, the sheer strength that it would take to do that, you know, people don't realize that. People think these things are, you know, this little kind teddy bears running around in the woods. These things are not teddy bears. Boys, oh. I'm going to tell you something. Something that could break a 10 inch limb like that, pop it like sewing thread, you know, could you imagine what that could actually do to you or me if, if it got a hold of us? Oh, yeah. And uh, actually going back to, to the vocalizations, which is not something I've heard much. Um, the fall before me and my mom and my daughter had our site, um, it was down on the dirt road. I was parked in the field right there on the farm. My uncle, he still owns that farm. It was me and uh cousin, three or four buddies. Now, we'd been out coyote hunting, and we, we had gotten back to the truck. I mean, it was late, midnight or so, and we were loading up and everything. And first time I'd ever heard it, way up, like way up the creek, up in there, I mean, middle of nowhere, up in them bushes, sounded like a tree knock. And my cousin was actually one, because I wasn't sure I knew what I heard. I mean, he looked at me, he said, is that what I think it was? And I was just, I don't know. So I did, the only whoop I'd ever heard a recording of was that two syllable, like that, whoop. You know, right. and I did that and I can do it pretty good, you know, pretty smooth. And that was one of them real nice, late fall, cool, quiet nights. You know, it echoed up at bottom 
and it whooped perfectly right back at me. And that was it. We didn't hear anything else, nothing else, because of course, a couple buddies like, oh, somebody's messing with us, this and that and other. I'm like, you have any idea where that just came from? <laughs> we had to walk like 45 minutes, cross the creek three times, two fences just to get there. Then added to the fact that it was somebody messing with us out there in the middle of nowhere at midnight, I feel like they would have done more than just do a random tree knock and whoop like that. So, you know, you you get off the beaten trail far enough. I mean, you know, I, yeah, and I will say good. honestly, I, I I I call it luck. Some people probably would call it that, but I call it luck because, you know, I mean, I don't want one to jump out and rip my head off like that. But you know, to hear no. and see them find any kind of evidence you know want you know i tell anybody once it's got in you you can't leave it alone it you know it it's like once they on your radar and you know that they're real and they're out there you just won't i don't know it's like now, you want more validation no more you want to learn more what's your what's your opinion of what they are like what what's your theories what's your i mean do you feel like they're a do you feel like they're part human? Do you feel like they're John again, you know, possibly John again, Epiphicus? I mean, what's your, your take on them? The Gigantopithecus thing. I really don't know where to go with that. Other than Gigantopithecus has totally been built off of fossil tooth remains. That limits that pretty much to them knowing it as a very large primate that was probably bipedal. As far as intelligence, mannerisms, any of that, I mean, there's no way to know based on just what they know about Gigantopithecus because it is very limited. And I'm not knocking science for it because paleontology is in itself just a challenge. I mean, you have so little material to work with. So... I'm I'm really not either way on the Gigantopithecus theory. Um, my personal theory, they're definitely a primate, a hominid, that I believe are extremely closely related to humans based on what little bit of what I think is credible DNA evidence. Um, added to the fact, I'll say this and I'll leave it at this, being in some of the circles and groups I've been in, and I'm going to leave it at that. Some of the things I've been shown that have kept not public um, would blow your mind, especially the very small handful of extremely good photos and stills I've seen of their face. They're extremely human-like, way more than chimpanzee, orangutan, gorilla. I mean, to the point that when you hear about those stories where, say, a hunter saw one face-to-face -face and everybody's like, why didn't you shoot it? And they say, because it looks so much like a man, I couldn't. They're not lying. They're being extremely descriptive and sincere with what they're saying because the the one, the closest one I saw was the one in the light, but I didn't see his face. By the time the light got to it, he was already, I mean, he was getting out of Dodge. He did not want to be in that light. So all I saw was pretty much his back, a hip, like a shoulder kind of an elbow. I mean, it was just a glimpse. But the evidence that I've seen that I will personally say is very credible to me just because the places it came from. Exceptionally intelligent. Um, resourceful, stealthy, and intentionally do not want to be known. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be fooled with. If they interact with you, they're doing it on a certain level for a certain reason that is for their own means, whatever that may be. Probably most time to get you out of there, keep you distracted from something they're trying to get away from you, probably young ones or old ones. But I can just personally say some of the things I've been shown and shared with me, it's they are they are on a high, high level near us. I mean, on a level that's kind of creepy. And I also, I mean, I ain't going to get into no big, deep conspiracy stuff. Um, 
I do believe that uh, under the radar, they're definitely known about and probably well more understood by certain entities or organizations that we can't compete with on a private level, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I agree 100% on that. It's pretty much but, my my take on it. Yeah. I don't I just don't think there's some wild animal out there running around. No. I think they live I think they live in existence that's good for them, it's peaceful for them, and they're happy with it. And it could be as simple as a thing as a human t- human top species that they're tr- you know if you want to call them tribes um just they never evolved into what we did well you know and i've, I've actually i think a lot you know i wish i didn't sometimes but i do and you know i was actually watching a movie the other night um it's called alpha i don't feel familiar with it it's uh takes place in europe like twenty thousand years ago it's pretty much about a young boy almost dies on a hunting trip. I mean, these are like, you know, Neolithic people. Anyways, point being, at one point, he actually eats raw meat. Just a a bite of raw meat rabbit. Well, we can't do that because our appendix has de-evolved to the point that we cannot process raw meat without getting sick. We have to cook it. The reason we have to cook is because people have been cooking meat for the last 10,000 years because we discovered fire around you know, what, 56,000 years ago? Who's to say that this isn't an extremely intelligent hominid species that probably learned the hard way to stay away from us because we're the most violent animal on the planet. We, our whole society is where it is because every, just about every major breakthrough, including medicine, technology, you name it, food, storage, preparation, vehicles, travel, airplanes, the internet, everything. The only reason we've excelled so much at technology is because every time we have a big war going on, we're trying to make the next best weapon to beat the other country or army or whatever. We only excel truly through violence. And that is a sad truth. I'm not trying to get too deep with that, but that is a fact because that is what mankind at the end of the day, it really is. So if you were a super intelligent hominid species that did not need the benefit of technology or modern comforts that we take for granted to survive comfortably and happily, why would you want to be found? Yep. That's exactly right. And my, and that's my not so, I mean, and out of anything that you, you know, any type of uh, theory or whatever, you know, that is probably the one of the least far-fetched, I mean, that you could honestly come up with right that's it and what what really gets me about these things is you know people make out like they're just dumb apes out there running around in the woods well i'm gonna tell you what they ain't dumb i was i was raised up you know in the woods i've been hunting ever since i was seven years old i've hunted probably every game species that is known in this area where we live here i've been out west hunting uh quite a few times uh and you know from my own experience, I know what it takes to be able to actually to, to be able to actually go out in the field and survive. And you know, to me, what these creatures are capable of doing and living, and the way they're, they're capable of living and surviving and actually thriving, you know, uh, hey, my hat goes off to them. These, these animals are are much smarter. Than what man gives them, you know, credit of being. Well, you know, and I'll, I'll compare this to something else. This is kind of, this kind of a random tangent, but it'll kind of put it in perspective for you. So, a good friend of mine, he is a safety director at a high, um, high security penitentiary, and every couple of days they they do shakedowns. You know, they hit the sales randomly just to see what, you know, the inmates have. And he has told me himself, it is shocking at what they can make out of near nothing to accomplish what they want to do. These ain't guys that graduated MIT. These ain't, most of them ain't guys that's been trained by the special forces in the military. They didn't grow up with some 
primitive tribe in you know South America. These guys off streets did something bad to get them where they are. But it proves that any intelligent species, when given a challenge, will excel with whatever they have at hand. So once again, you take a sophisticated hominid species that has made its point to not be found by human beings for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years probably, they got pretty good at it. So. Oh, no, most definitely, most definitely. Yeah. Like I say, you yeah. know, it goes back. To, it goes back to the, to the deal that uh, uh, those things are much smarter than we are as far as being able to survive in their element. Uh, yep. You know, you tell me how many how many people could actually go out into the woods, take nothing with them, no food, no water, anything. You know, maybe a pocket knife or whatever. You go out into the woods. And you live the Sasquatch lives, you know. How you know the only guy that that actually comes to mind would be Eric Rudolph, uh, the uh, Olympic bomber that yep. stayed hid in the mountains of North Carolina for what seven eight years up there. That, Long time. Yep. And even even him, you know, they caught him going through the trash behind a restaurant looking for food. Right. Yep. Could be. He was hungry. I mean, he's out there just literally surviving, you know. And I'll even, I mean, look at the cases of feral children. There have been a very rare few of true feral children that have been raised by animals in the wild. And by the time they're six, seven, eight years old, and they're literally, I mean, basically a wild animal. So once again, if you've got cases of human beings that can do that, why can't you have a hominid species? Because I'm going to tell you right now, if I wanted to disappear in the woods and you gave me just a good, decent piece of land and then covered me with hair that made, you know, literally made me camouflage, who's going to find me? And the thing about it is, you know, as humans, we have a lot of primal, primal nature. It's just it's took out of us nowadays. I mean, That's if it. you That's go back to our our roots, you know, we're ba you know, a lot of our behaviors would be the same as uh, Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, mean that's the best way you can put it. I mean, even within this century, you've had Native Americans that went off the grid. I mean, disappeared into the wilderness and would live for years and years and years by themselves because that's what they wanted to do. And they were living completely primitive without the benefit of any technology. So, and actually you know, better than now at it. Yeah, I mean, they definitely. That's so. the sad I mean, part. You know, we're given all this technology and all this, you know, um, you know, just modern society. And heck, you know, most humans nowadays can't even survive with that. I oh, mean, yeah, you know. No, that that's I mean, the sad part about it. I mean, it's just like when, when a snowstorm comes, you know, everybody runs the store and just buys up everything it can. The power goes out, people panic, you know, and it's because we've gotten so cold. And I mean, I'm, I ain't gonna say I'm guilty of that because I think that's ridiculous, but I'll tell you right now, I'm the first one when the power goes out, I get real pouty about it because I want my lights, <laughs> I want my, and my heat, I want hot showers, you know. <laughs> But I that, what I, like what it. I'm getting at is we're wild. People forget we're animals. We are wild animals. Yep. We just involved, and other things haven't evolved as much as we have. Yep. Why why we involved in who we are and what we are and what we're able to accomplish? You know that's a little beyond, you know whatever. But at the end of the day, you know we're wild animals. Well, you know what. Yep. You know, it goes back to the we really, we really don't know a whole lot about Sasquatch. We really, honest to God, guys, we don't no. know. We have very little knowledge of this creature other than this well, creature exists. And you, and, know, you know, I think they're a little bit more known about the creature than general public knows. But go ahead. Well, you know, I'm just saying that that these creatures. 
you know, you know, who's to say that these creatures don't bathe? Who's to say these creatures don't uh, uh, hunt? Uh, we know they live in family units. We know they have children. They they raise their they raise their young just like we do. So you know, who's to say what kind of knowledge these creatures actually possess? It, it ain't no telling. I mean, I've heard stories of them, people living out remote areas of them standing outside watching TV through the windows. I mean, these <laughs> come from people that are to me. I guess just out of curiosity. Why not? You know, that would be the ultimate. I don't know if that'd be the ultimate thrill or the ultimate scare for me would be to uh, stand up and watch one of those, have one of those things looking in the window at me. That would. Yeah, I, I don't have much problem going out in the woods looking for them, but I don't want them hanging around my house. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want them coming over for Sunday dinner? <laughs> yeah, that, I don't. I don't want them just you know, you know, peeking in the windows at night or you know, sitting on my tailgate of my truck in the morning when I go to work or something like that. that <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna have to get to know them a lot better than I do before I get to that point. Right. And like a sister-in-law of mine, they, they live up at uh, the foot of Grassy Mountain up in Murray County. And uh, uh, where they live, it's like a, a, a big uh, horseshoe there around. The, the mountains actually surrounds them on three sides. And their driveway is like 400 foot long from the main road going up into where they live. Just a gravel drive going up to where they live at and had this big holly. And she goes out one morning to go to work. And there's a like 400 and 400, 350, 400 pound black bear standing in the bed of her truck eating garbage, a bag of garbage that she had placed there the night before. Well, she just politely, well, she, she, don't, she doesn't scream. You know, most women would berserk, go berserk. You know, most guys would, I guess, in a situation like that. She just politely turns around, walks back up the doorstep, goes back in, sits down. My brother gets up and walks through there and asks her some Oh, woman, you're going to be late for work, ain't you? Brenda's reply was, well, if you'll go out there and run that bar out of the bed of my truck, I'll, I'll go to work. Lowell says, what bar? <laughs> Brenda says, what? That bar's out there wanting to eat that garbage worse than I need to go to work. So <laughs> Lowell looks out the, the door. The bar's still out there feasting on the bag of garbage. <laughs> he turns around and looks at Brenda. He says, well, hell, I guess you need to call them and tell them you're going to be late for work because I'm not going out there running that sucker out of that truck. The next day, they had the game board up there with the big traps and I was actually able to catch the bear and take it back up on top of the mountain above where they live, turn it loose. But, you know, uh, it would be the same way walking out in a Sasquatch, you know, out in your front yard. What would you do? Oh, yeah. Turn around yes. and go back in <laughs> I, the only thing I would know to do is hopefully snap a picture of a video, but no, I don't, I don't want to get up in the morning and have to worry about walking outside and there being a nine foot, 1200 pound. Yeah. Yeah. That would be. Where oh, yeah. they are. I don't know where I am. <laughs> that would that would be bad, Maybe. boys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I I think sooner or later, I mean, it, it's it's gonna happen. I mean, whether well, somebody actually finds one or you know, I'm for I, I'm honestly afraid somebody's going to end up killing one. And well, then I, one, Chris, I was going to ask you before we get off off the show here of. Uh, what is your feelings? You know, we have everyone from from uh, 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 Meldridge to all the other big scientists that, that actually say, you know, the only way we're going to actually prove beyond a shadow of doubt that these things do exist is produce a body. What is your feelings? Would you, if you come in close contact with one of these things, Travis, with gun in hand, would you shoot one of these these magnificent creatures, you know, just so a scientist could hack it up and say, yeah, 
I would completely compare it to the same situation if I was put in a situation that I had no active fire on a human being. Because as far as I'm concerned, that would be the position that I would have to be put into was I was immediately being threatened for my own life or someone else's. Beyond that, if I'm walking there, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm all, if, I'm, if I'm out, I'm armed. Always. That's just me. I carry, I can still carry. I carry in the woods. I mean, I just always have, always well, will. That's just personal protection. Yeah. But, no, because I will tell you, the night that we saw the one we saw, I had an AR-15 with a loaded 30-round mag chambered with my thumb on the safety because I didn't got a little little protective and a little spooked and honestly had the opportunity. I could have opened up on that dude and probably put five or six in his back before he got out of my life. But that never crossed my mind, and the reason being is – I would love for a body to be produced naturally or remains naturally. I don't believe that's going to happen because I do believe they bury their dead very, very carefully and meticulously on purpose. But to kill one to prove their existence to me is like the biggest contradiction in terms ever. That is just absolutely unethical, completely wrong to kill something that's to me that that rare and that special just to prove to people because they're so arrogant to believe that they don't exist that no me personally no, i'm that's absolutely not, no feeling. that's my no. feeling exactly yeah, yeah. You know, that's what I, that's what i tell everyone that comes into the group you know i tell them you know straight up you know we're an no-kill group we don't believe in killing one uh you know and, and I'm like you are, you know, as far as personal protection, if one if one actually charged me and I knew that the creature was going to hurt me, you know, and it came down to, to me or it, and I I was armed, then yes, I would probably put a bullet in one. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's where I would, have, I would have to be, I mean, like I say, that, that one at night, I mean, you got to understand, I mean, I have my mama and my 14-year-old daughter with me. And I didn't got, I, mean, I ain't gonna say, I wasn't scared, but I had gotten like edgy, you know what I mean? You know, it's, it's right. a difference in, you know what I mean? You can get to that point where you're like, you know, this is off. But even then, he would have literally had to just come charging at us, teeth bare, hollering, whatever it may be, for me to do that. I mean, I just, I have no desire. I believe it's wrong. Um, I could, I honestly could care less if the world ever knows for sure that they exist because I know they do. Y'all know that they do. Anybody that really wants to know if they exist, get out there and look for them. That's it. Yeah. I mean, I, we, us, us people who are in this, this circle that know and have experienced it, we don't owe the world or society or public or anybody nothing as far as proving it to anybody. I will do yeah, my, that's, my best to present that's it. That's my yeah. feeling exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. one thing, you know, me and Ricky, we, you know, that's one thing that we agree on is we not, we're not trying to prove nothing to nobody. We do this because we, you know, it's it's a mission to ourselves. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I'm Virginia Lee from Animal Research. And what us as Animal Research would love to do is somehow – not that way, because we're not into that either. Prove their existence, honestly, to protect them, because yep. I believe they deserve that. But sad truth is, you know how, I mean, people are unbelievably skeptical of something they don't want to believe. And I think this is one of the things people don't want to believe, because, yes, the idea of an eight, nine foot. A monster people, running around in the woods, monster, pretty much. It's a yep. monster. That's it. It's a monster. And people don't want to believe that that's out there because then they're going to say, We have monsters in our woods. Yep. Yep. So, well, you know, I've, in yeah. I've interviewed guys that uh, have actually come in contact with these things that uh, uh, travel the Appalachian Trail. And yeah. uh, I was talking to a boy a couple of months ago and he told me a story. I've got it here on paper that I wrote it down. Uh, 
he said that he was uh, uh, hiking, uh, said he was about two miles from uh, the Blood Mountain uh, shelter over there on the mountain and uh, uh, over on Blue Ridge WMA. And uh, he said that uh, he had been hiking with a group earlier in the day. It had started getting dark. This group that he was with, they were going on to, to the shelter there at Blood Mountain. Well, he said he was tired. His feet was hurting him. And he had decided a couple of miles back this side of Blood Mountain, he would just stop at a small creek and uh, pitch his camp for the night. And he told me, he said it was probably one of the worst mistakes I ever made. He said, but then I wouldn't have ever got to actually, to actually see these things the way I saw them. He said that he was had a, a, a big bonfire built up, uh, preparing dinner, and he said he, he got to smelling this rank smell. Said he got to looking around, and he actually saw one of these things peeking out around a pine tree at him, out at about forty yards. Well, he said all I done was I hunkered down behind the fire and just just watched. Well, he said you're, he said in probably about ten minutes elapsed. There were two of these things that actually came out of the wood line and approached his farm. And he said the the one that was in the lead was a bigger one. And he said that it was really didn't show any fear at all until it got up about 10 foot from the far. And he said, I don't know why I done it. He said, but I stood up and I hollered uh, yay or something at him. And he said, when I did, he said the smaller one that was behind the big one, he said it jumped backwards and done a complete flip and turned and went back into the wood line. And he said the big one stood there and, and yanked its head around us. And he it said its eyes got real big. And, and he said that it was just like it was amazed, you know. And, and all of a sudden, he said that it, it he said, I, he, said I, he said, I guess I scared it. He said, you know, but I didn't scare it any worse than they had scared me. But he said this thing turned and back into the wood line it went. But he said these things were not there to hurt him. They were just very curious and they were investigating that far. So these creatures are, you know, from what Blake and I have experienced over the years. These things are a very curious creature. You know, if you're out in the woods, you really don't have to go looking for these things because you can sit and build a fire up at night, roast a few winnies or whatever. And if these things are around, they're going to come and investigate you. Oh yeah. One thing. One thing I have to say is, I mean, you know, ever I, I, you know, I've heard a lot of uh, people, you know, feel threatened. Um, I mean, even even with the stuff me and Ricky's had happen to us, and as close as I've been with that, you know, they've been to us and everything, I've never felt threatened. Uh, more of, you know, when the first couple times we had stuff happen, yeah, I mean, not gonna lie, I was scared, but well, that's natural, never, <laughs> yeah, but I've ne never feared for my life or felt like, you know, the you know, this is the end, like, you know, we're gonna get attacked, no, not by any means. I mean, I my whole thing is always tell people, I mean, them same woods down there. Where I had my experiences, had my sightings, had the tent poked on, been followed. I literally, as a kid, ran them creek bottoms barefoot alone, seven, eight years old. If they wanted to get me, they'd have got me. They got I mean, you, yeah. I had given them all the opportunities they could ever ask for to get me. So, you know. Well, you know, you know I've hunted, like I said, ever since I was seven years old, uh, hunted these mountains through here, and, uh, uh, you know, everything from a deer, a fox, a raccoon even, bear, mountain lion, whatever. You know, these creatures are just like Sasquatch. They're curious of you. They're curious of what you're doing and why you're there in their home. And, you know, they may approach you. They may get out 40, 50 yards from you and stand and watch you and study you. But really, I'm like Blake. I've never really felt any fear from anything like that. 
unless I think one of the main things is making them not feel fear fear. You yeah. know, I mean, like you yeah. don't don't make them feel threatened. You take the only you know, time I'm I would sure. actually the only time I would actually be for, afraid of one of these creatures would be if they had young creatures with them, if they had their young with them, and that you know as well as I do, hog whatever. You know, that's if true. you get in too close I mean, to their young, they're going they're going to attack. That's even people. I mean, I'm a totally different animal if I've got my kid with me. You know, I mean, I being out around people, whatever. I mean, I've been in some, you know, sticky situations before. But me on my own, I'm a whole lot different. Because I mean, I can get the hell out of dodge if I need to. But when you have a child with you, you know, you just you're a whole different everything. So, right. And, and, with any any kind of animal, I mean, whether it be upper end, more sophisticated intelligence such as primates, whatever, all the way down to, like you say, I mean, a fox or a, I mean, a house cat, you know, anything. I and I'm the same way, you know. If, say you all out there rambling around, whatever, and you happen up on what's their home place at the moment, and they do have little ones around. They're going to try their best to get you out of there, usually by intimidation. You know, throw stuff at you, break this, and holler, and hoop, and, and it'll work. It always works. I mean, why wouldn't it? It's freaky. You know, I mean, that's scary. <laughs> you know? so, and that, but it's not violent. I got I got pushed out about two years ago up in that area. I actually went up a coyote hunt. I did an afternoon coyote hunt. And I went on up the creek ways there, and I built me a little fire, and I fixed me some food. And I was just kind of enjoying being out, you know. And I thought I heard a knock up the creek, but it was a little breezy that evening, so I'm not sure. But all of a sudden, nothing happened. I just all of a sudden got, like, that real overwhelming feeling that I shouldn't be there. Like, just an instinctive, not afraid. It wasn't a scary thing. It just, it just didn't feel right, and I just felt like it was time to go, and I did. I, I got up. Real easy, just work my way on back out. And I got down to the dirt road, and I was crossing this little single lane bridge across this creek, and I had to walk across that bridge to get to my truck. And um, it's got the reflectors on the edge of the bridge. And I was about halfway across that bridge when a rock hit that reflector behind me. And, it, I mean, scared, that thing, it was loud. I mean, it just, like a gun went off. Scared me half to death. And... I don't know what that rock meant. I never saw the rock. I, it was probably a small rock, to be honest, but it hit that darn metal reflector with a loud. And I just feel like for whatever reason, they, they didn't want me there that day. But there was nothing. I never felt like I was in danger. You know, it was just like I just had that real heavy feeling and just don't, just go, leave. They, just, they were just making sure you got out of there. Yeah. Well, you know, like I, I tell did. everyone at the end of the show, you know, every week, uh, these things, uh, we don't know what triggers. We really don't. We do not know what triggers them. You know, ourselves as being human beings, we've got we've got a point that, you know, once you reach that point, you know, you, you lose it. And yeah. same way with these, same way with these creatures, we do we do not know what triggers you know, into actually turning violent. And I tell everybody, you know, if you're in the woods, you've never experienced this. You have one start throwing rocks at you, breaking limbs, you know, hooping, hollering, you know, whatever. Back out of the area and let them have it. That's, That's the it. best advice I can give anybody. I agree with that. I I just say, you know, respect. it's just like a dog growling in somebody's yard. You know, he's giving you a chance to walk away. Right, I mean, and you got to show him respect. <laughs> yeah, that's it. If you don't, you're going to get bit. Yep. I mean, if you keep pushing it to the point that you are going to, you you eventually you're going to get bit. Yeah. And that's the same way with these creatures. That's what I. That's my feelings for them. You know, if you yeah. keep pushing it, keep pushing your your, your boundaries, you're eventually going to get hurt. Yeah. So you know yep. that's that's. I you know, that's just my beliefs. A lot of people may think I'm crazy for believing that or, you know, having that kind of thought. But 
uh, you know, with what I've experienced out of them over the years, that's just that's that's my feelings for it. Well, guys, we went over our hour mark. We're uh, actually into an hour and a half, uh, so I'm going to back out of here. Travis, man, we really enjoyed having you tonight. Yes, Dude, anytime thank you, you want to come back and share anything with us or just, just talk, have fun like we've had tonight, just, just feel free. Just holler at us, and, and uh, we'll be glad to have you back on. You're welcome anytime you want to come back to the show. Yep. Thank right, you, Travis, right. for coming on tonight. Oh, yeah. Thank y'all for having me. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you very much, man. We really enjoyed it. All right, Travis, I'm going to take you off, man, and go ahead and end the show. Good to have you. Good to talk with you. Uh, I holler back at me anytime. We're always here. Just, just give us a shout. All right. Thank y'all. Have a great night, Thank brother. Thank you, man. Y'all too. Folks, as I always say, you know, we've come to the end of another broadcast, a uh, good broadcast. Uh, we had Travis Bowen on here from Animal Research. Travis is a good guy, very knowledgeable right. about, the, uh, about the subject of uh, Sasquatch. Uh, and like I say, you know, uh, hey, if you encounter one of these things, you're out in the woods, you run up on one of them. And I always say we don't know what triggers them, so just please just, just back out, let them have it, you know. Don't try to be big shot and run up and hug one of these things because I'm, I'm sure it's going to turn bad for you in the long run. Uh, Blake, do you have anything else, bud, before we go? And as always, guys, if you have any encounters, any stories, whether it be paranormal, UFOs, Bigfoot, Dogman, whatever, send an email to Ricky. We'll get back with you. Um, oh, yeah. and- Sasquatch Hunters 1981 at gmail.com, folks. And if you're not subscribed, guys, if you would, please give us a subscribe. Uh, hit the, nail, the, the little bell so every uh, every podcast we do, you get a notification for. Um, and thank you, guys. Y'all have a great night. All right, guys. And as always, folks, please hit that, to, as Blake said, yeah, hit the subscribe button. Hit and that a lot. like button. Yeah, like hit button. that like button. Show you YouTube that you like the content. And uh, folks, until next week, Rick Weaver, Blake Duckworth. See you later. <laughs>